Welcome to Indy's Real Estate Gurus. I'm Rick Ritma, your hardworking mortgage guy, and I've been in real estate and mortgages for over 34 years. I've helped over 5,300 folks finance their homes. My team and I believe in custom tailored loans, not the one size fits all approach. We believe there is the right mortgage for you, and we believe we are the team to deliver it. And I'm Ian Arnold, part of Rick's hardworking mortgage team. I've been in the financial industry for over 15 years, helping customers rebuild their credit to get the best possible interest rate. I also have a passion in uh, helping you secure your overall real estate dreams and even paying off your home even faster. And for the most up-to-date information on Indy's real estate market or mortgages, you can contact Ian or I at hardworkingmortgageguys.com. That's hardworkingmortgageguys.com. Or you can call 317-672-1938. That's 317-672-1938. And today we have David Landau. Hey, guys. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, you did. Good Welcome. job. We Thank you. It. Thanks for having you're me. You're with High Garden Real Estate. That's right. And uh, I mean, you're telling them you were in corporate. You did, you did a lot before real estate. So what... Kind of give us that background where you where you grew up and then what you did before real estate. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm a born and bred Hoosier. I grew up in Indianapolis. I did. Uh, we lived in Columbus, Ohio, briefly for a couple of years, and then we got transferred again when I was in corporate America to Maine, which okay. was lovely. Um, and we had to come back, unfortunately, un unexpectedly. But for the most part. Uh, I grew up uh, on the northwest side in Traders Point, went to Burboff, went to Wabash College for undergrad, went to Ball State for grad school, got out and was in corporate marketing and communications for many years. Um, and then in 2008, I decided to get my real estate license and was, was kind of a side hustle maybe before side hustles became a thing. And I was working on referral only uh friends and family saving them money on commissions when i could um and then in 2019 maybe before the great resignation became a thing my business had grown to the point where i could do it full time and i could support myself financially uh, by doing that I uh, chose to leave corporate America for a little bit more control over my own time and uh, do things on more on my terms. Um, and the travel became hectic. I was traveling globally, and uh, so uh, it was a it was a sort of a, a nice transition, and it's worked out well. Uh, doing this full time, I've grown my business incrementally every year, so the trajectory is going in the right <laughs> direction. It's it's continually gotten better and better. Of course, the what we experienced uh, during the pandemic in the 2020 2021 market, which was super hot with historically low interest rates. You guys know that yep. uh, that certainly helped, but but. Just like that, around this time last year, maybe July or August, the market took a turn. And but that's the neat thing about real estate, right? It's it's always evolving, it's always changing, and there are challenges, and the market adapts, and we adapt our business with the ultimate goal of making our clients happy and helping people realize their goals and their dreams. And it's continued to work out well for me, I should say. And so it's interesting because we get we, we get people who just jump in full time that, you know, they just leave their job and they say that's the only way to do it. And then we get people who did it just like you do slowly get in. It took you said you got in in 2008. You went full time in 2019. So 11 years. How hard was it to to because I think one of the problems I see with people is when they do that, they easily give up. Because they're tired they've been in work they're they got other things to do and they've yep. been working and they don't keep that dream alive so how did you do that and how hard is it to to keep that keep that momentum it's it's challenge but you get a good managing broker to my first managing broker we're we're still uh very much in touch uh was inspirational and they if if you have a good managing broker uh, that's always a positive to compliment. And I have just a natural drive 
you know, I have goals and I maybe in the beginning I had a, a little bit of a lower risk tolerance than some people, but you do well. Um, you make sure that your business is um, personal and about the client and not about yourself. And then the referrals start coming in. Now, all of those years I wasn't practicing. I, I moved out of state. Okay. So I only am licensed in Indiana. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I just hung my license up uh, at, in referral status for those years, but then came back. And I'll tell you the other, the other motivation for getting into it full time was um, I had an unexpected loss, which is why we came back from Maine. I had a parent that died suddenly and it, and my, so my mother passed away suddenly and my dad had passed away a few months prior to that. So I found myself an orphan. I had to come back and sell properties, um, settle estates. But that was sort of a turning point for me because with the sudden loss of my, my mom, again, it was unexpected. It really starts making you think that life is short. Yeah. And when you have goals and dreams, you get one shot, right? And so that was another huge motivation for me to do it full time because as a kid, I was the kid that was playing with uh, Legos and Lincoln Logs and I was building homes and using those and I was always interested in homes. And I was even uh, taking empty boxes and I would take have my mom take me to, um, to there was a to Ed Shocks. I don't oh, know yeah, if, I remember Ed Shocks. Yeah. In Broad Ripple. Yep. Yep. Uh, Ed Shocks and you could buy miniature furniture and stuff is really for, maybe for doll houses, but I would do interiors, like I would do staging. Wow. And so, so from a very early age, I was interested in homes and, and, and so it stayed with me. You know, I landed in corporate America because that was sort of, I went to a liberal arts college, I went to Wabash, that was kind of, you know, the, the, the proper thing to do. And I realized all those years in corporate America with, you know, wanting to be in more control of my own life, um, plus what happened in my personal life right. with my parents, that I just made the decision to do it full time. Yeah. So um, it is hard getting started, but if you focus on your customer and focus on your client and make it about them, not about yourself, um, and you're... Uh, more client focused and not transactional focused um, than the referrals. It's a, it's a good client experience. Um, and then the referrals, they've had such a good positive experience with you. They refer their friends and family and that's, it takes a while because you know, not everyone buys a house every year every year, every couple of years, right? You know, you know, usually we see three to five years unless something is going on in their personal life where they have to buy and sell. So it, it does take a while. Yeah. 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 That's one thing that Rick and I've had that conversation about several times is it's not about the transaction. Yeah. It is about the person. Yeah. And I mean, just like we've seen it in our industry and stuff. Oh, that's a $50,000 loan. I don't really want to work. On. No, no, no. If you take care of them, you'll see it on the back end. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about the money. Just take care of the people. And I have I have heard of instances where where people say, yeah, the price point, I'm not even dealing with that price point. But that, that price point may, might be an entry-level price point, and then people buy up, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So I, I do plenty of those deals, and people – either add to their family they start having children they start climbing the corporate ladder they've got m more income their credit situation has improved finance rates have improved so they can buy more um so that initial hundred thousand hundred twenty thousand dollar first time home might turn into a three hundred thousand dollar second home right so yeah 
it's it's about helping people realize their goals and in corporate america they they sort of call it servant servant leadership yeah i think well i think adapting that from corporate america into my business as a real estate agent has really helped me because it's 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 about serving your clients yeah it, that's all it really is yep. it's it, it's they already know the house they can everybody can look up all that information they can see everything but they need in mortgages and in real estate they need a professional who knows what they're doing who because there's so much more than just what it looks like online there's there's so much into negotiating the pricing uh you know making sure you know having people come into your house if you're you're listing your house having a, a, a pricing it correctly yep you know not too high not too low it yep. matters what you price a home at and it matters how many people you're going to get through so it's vitally important to get a solid you know a guru real estate agent on your side i think i think yeah. it's vital yeah so i'm glad that you raised that point because negotiation that's why people go with agents because of the negotiation aspect some people aren't good at that coming from corporate america where you do have to negotiate with different parts of the business you do have to reach consensus you don't always get your way in corporate america when you're dealing cross-functionally right? right and i it's what helped me be uh, in my opinion and in the opinion of some of my clients hopefully all of them is my negotiation skills because i bring that background from the corporate side into my business um you know and um it's not only the negotiation skills i think that's important um it's also what are your resources what are the contractors the vendors that you have in your the lenders the window people when you go you know i've been in sticky uh inspection uh phases where we're trying to negotiate uh inspection items and knowing the right people to bring sort of cost effective solutions makes it an easier hurdle to clear on both the buyer and the seller side right so that's all that's all part of it Look, getting the the a property under contract is just the first step. Right. You've got to you've got to get it appraised unless you have a waiver, um, and you've got to clear the inspection phase. Those are the the two next biggest things. And if one of those things go sideways, then the deal doesn't make it across the finish line. You got to start all over. You might have an un unhappy buyer. You might have an unhappy seller. No one really wants to see that. So it's the, the important thing in an agent is the negotiation skills, is the resources that they bring to the table. Is their lender reachable on a Saturday at 10 PM? If we have a question for writing a, an offer, um, so that th those are important things. Yeah. 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 It's important that people are available. It's important that you have, that, you know, a very knowledgeable real estate agent who's gone through so much yep. or, you know, you, you kind of alluded to this or they have a great team or mentors that they can also tie into because they aren't going to know everything, but they need a, they need that mentorship. They need the other people they work with who they can easily get all yeah. of to, yeah, my first broker, I mean, I'm at a different brokerage. She left the brokerage that we were together at and she started her own brokerage and I still contact her. Yeah. Uh, you know, with questions. I mean, I I contact my my managing broker now, yeah. but she and I just had that deep I think it's because she was my first managing broker and th and there is you know, when you're first starting out in, in as a realtor, you're just you're out there like and and getting your confidence up to a point where um you know you feel good about what you're doing that's important too yes. you want your clients to see that confidence and she was an important factor in that and if somebody is wanting to work with you and have access to all your contacts and, and be able to help no matter what whether buying or selling how would they get a hold of you yeah, they can calling or texting works beautifully for me. Uh, at they can call me or text at three one seven 
317-431-3830. What's that number again? 317-431-3830. And I've got my phone with me all the time. And call or text. You don't That's care. right. Nope. Perfect. And to get a hold of Ian or I, go to hardworkingmortgageguys.com. That's hardworkingmortgageguys.com. Or you can call 317-672-1938. That's 317-672-1938. And thank you for listening to Indy's Real Estate Gurus. The gurus we interview share valuable insights. They reveal their strengths, personalities, and how they'll work for you. Well, the heart, while we hardworking mortgage guys secure your best mortgage, Real estate gurus work hard, too. They avoid problems the amateurs don't see. They listen. They find unrealized opportunities. If you're bu buying or selling a home, a real estate guru is a valuable asset. If you're even thinking of buying or selling a home, keep listening and definitely call one of Indy's real estate gurus. All right. So let's take a little sidestep away from real estate for a little bit. Let's know. Let's get to know you. Oh, so, yeah. Let me take away that phone that you just gave people a phone number that you said you're always connected to. So I'm going to take that away for 24 hours. What do we catch you doing for fun? Oh, man. Uh, so I live in Butler, Tarkington. I've lived there since 2006. You will find me chatting with neighbors. I've got three dogs. I'm walking them all over my neighborhood all the time. Two, two of my – and they're all rescue dogs. So two of my rescues are two years old around two years old. So they still have a lot of energy. So I'm constantly walking around my neighborhood, constantly seeing what's going on in my neighborhood, what's maybe listed, what's pending, um, who's fixing up uh, properties. Uh, so, and there's a Starbucks and a market that's walkable. So uh, I'm always there too, caffeine addict. Um, or I'm, doing stuff to my own house, yeah. <laughs> which, you know, it's a 1926 house. So there's constant, constant work to be done. So, um, but usually, I mean, real estate is such a people business. I really enjoy talking with my neighbors. Um, so, and I'm constantly, I'm not a Gladys Kravitz kind of person. Like I'm trying to be nosy and but uh, I like just keeping in touch with my neighbors. Um, I'm an extrovert, so that kind of kills two birds with one stone. I'm kind of seeing what's going on, who's coming in, who's leaving. A actually, the only thing that I'm getting real, I get real nosy about is when I see people doing work to their home. I kind of like, if they're out there, I kind of like to see what, what they're doing, right? Because that always gives me ideas when I have a client who's like, hey, what do you think about maybe I'm interested in this house. What do you think about maybe doing this great idea? Or have you thought about this? Because I've seen it done somewhere else. So right. yeah. yeah, the HGTV shows are great, but I, I find them to be a little bit unrealistic. So that's why I like seeing what's really happening on the ground. Um, and I like in my neighborhood, I, I like being the local expert, right? So I, I try and keep tabs of what's going on. So committed to my dogs. Uh, I work really weird hours because you never know. I uh, was working on an inspection response at 1230 in the morning uh, yesterday morning. <laughs> so, you know, if I'm not with doing stuff on my house, either on the inside or the outside or walking around with the dogs, I'm working these kinds of crazy hours. Right. So, yeah. So I got to ask. Yeah. So Rick lives in an older house, too. Yeah. And he recently remodeled and he, they, he replaced some of his flooring. And he said he had like three or four layers of flooring. Yeah. Do you have the same issue? No. Uh, <laughs> I had uh, all original hardwoods uh, from 1926. Unfortunately, I had to replace the hardwoods because there were spots where the damage was so severe that they couldn't be refinished if they tried to refinish it that the the um the boards would they, they just get too thin right if they right. tried to sand some of that damage and the, you could go if you were super committed you could go try and match the wood at a salvage um but you know it unfortunately and it, it kind of i killed me to do this it was just easier and more cost effective to replace all the hardwoods and that's what i did 
So yeah. I didn't, I did not have that though. I just had the, the, the original hardwoods and it was the, you know, back in the twenties, they used the tire Oak, which you just don't see anymore. It's just too expensive to harvest that. So. Yeah. I had the same issue. Yeah. Only my, my floor, they had pulled out some of them and there was underlayment in because obviously there had been water damage at some okay. point in time. And so when they pulled the carpet up, they couldn't refinish the floor. So yeah. we had to rip them all out. Yeah. It just made me sick. To yeah. Rip them all out. Yeah. But what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, and, and, and they weren't level. I mean, so it's just, there's just not. And also by the time they've ripped the carpet out, you're not going to go, okay, let's stop. Let me go find some wood that's going to match. Yeah. I mean, at least I'm not. Yeah. My <laughs> wife is never going to let me do that. Yeah. And, and remodeling, we did way too much anyway. It was our was our biggest problem. We did so you over improve. <laughs> it, we, it was so much time. I may have over improved, but I, I'm not going to sell. So what do I, you know, really? That's right. I want to enjoy it. Yeah. But I, you know, we, we uh, it took forever. And my wife has four cats. And my wife is a very dedicated pet owner. So she won't leave them and she's afraid they're going to let them out the door. So she sat there the entire day, every day for month after month. Yeah. It's a tough, I mean, it's a tough, it's tough. Thing. It's a tough thing. Well, to do. if you live in an older home and that's really one of the challenges because now I have plaster walls and they've got a subtle texture. That was a thing back in the twenties. Also the ceiling, the plaster work, they, they just, the, the, it's a lost art. They, there are very few trades people that still do that. Right. When I, I bought my house, I try to keep it the, the, the historic character of it. And, and you know why is because when the concrete was poured in the basement, someone, I don't know if it was the, the builder, the original owner wrote their name in the concrete while it was still wet and the date the concrete was poured which was september something 1920s like september 10th 1920 wow. so someone was really proud of what they were doing and to honor that you know when i you know have had this house since 2006 i didn't want to do anything too crazy so that's why it killed me to take those yeah. hardwoods out um but it truly is hard to find crap artisans you know because now everything is just so different and um so if you find someone like that uh not only are they hard to get calendared in because everyone wants right. them they're they charge you premium yeah. yeah but, but i live it. in butler tarkington meridian kessler i'm right on the the edge you know uh you kind of want to do that to the extent that you can yeah. so yeah so i've got lots of lots of projects but you have to space them <laughs> otherwise you go bankrupt and... yeah. you go bankrupt <laughs> <Yeah>. crazy <laughs> yeah that's right that's right so um but i love the old houses and going to your point where like nothing's level hey i i nothing's nothing's, nothing's level, level in my house and i think p even my new floors squeak they they creak i'm good with it you know it's an old house and right yeah. you can expect it yeah. in an old house I, i've seen actually new construction yeah. <laughs> where things aren't level so yeah i i mean our our guys on our main level when we when we remodeled that they they did everything they could to level it and they said we got it flat we didn't get it level yeah we can't get it level yeah. it's impossible to get it level it's it's sunk too much so yeah. there was no way to do that but it's it's flat yeah. You know, but the, we had tile put in and some of the tile has cracks in it. You, it's very difficult to see, but you can see it. But what do you got to do? It's yeah. just the way it is. Yeah. My son has a house in Chicago he bought a couple of years ago. His is a 1920s. And he has the, the, the uh, not drywall, but the plaster. plaster. Yep. And he said, well, first he had somebody come in who's a professional at that. She, it, it's one of his in-laws' friends. And she did. She she re, she fixed it all. She painted it. She hung. She, he wanted. They wanted wallpaper. They hung the wallpaper. But he said that the beauty of plaster is he said when it gets cold, you if you air condition the house and it gets cold, it stays cold. 
and when it gets warm, it stays warm. So in the in the winter, the house is warmer. In the in the in the summer, the house is cooler. He loves his plaster. Yeah. So there are big benefits to it. So I think maybe in Chicago, in that market, there are probably the, more options for those types of tradespeople. In Indianapolis, it's it's a little tougher. Okay. It's not as big of a market. Um, yeah. So I mean, I wouldn't. You know, I, I have a sister that lives in Fishers uh, in a subdivision. Their home is like a 2000. Great home. Great for them. I couldn't see myself. And and honestly, going back to my clients, when um, I say, you know, you have to make the experience about them. When I get a client who's looking at an older home, I I sometimes forget about that and get so excited <laughs> about original tile, just things that are original. I get so excited that people have preserved that charm and that character. I, I kind of forget who the home buyer is for a second, right? Yeah. And I've seen some fantastic homes in the city where the the old original tile is pristine and in great shape. But Maybe the rest of the home isn't, or the the original trim is in and French French doors are in perfect shape, and and I'm like, this is fantastic, and and sometimes I think buyers don't realize how fantastic it really is. Yeah. So I mean, there's been a couple homes I've seen that I would I would buy just for that stuff. I mean, I get so excited when I see that that's been preserved as well as it has. I like both. I like new homes. I think I spent 11 years with a new home builder. I like new homes. I think they do a phenomenal job. Yeah. And I think there's some things that are better than the old. Like windows are much better today than they were, right? <laughs> yep. You know, there's some things that are better. But the, it's hard to get what you got in an old home. But yeah. I think, you know, there are people for both of them. And yeah. Oh, fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the great thing about real estate. There is truly something for everyone. Yep. Single family homes duplexes if you want to live on one side and and generate some income uh help pay for the mortgage you can rent the other side i've had clients do that maybe you don't like cutting the grass maybe you don't want to deal with any of that then there's condos for that right. yeah yep. so if you want low maintenance that's fine if you want a fixer upper they got plenty of those um but going back to the the trades people i will tell you that uh, the, the, what happened to the market in 2008, 2009, um, we lost a lot of those trades, those trades of people. Yeah. I just, um, and I don't think they ever came back. I don't uh, think so either. Yeah, they, left, they, they went and found something else and that's what they do now. That's right. So that, that is another challenge. If you know, you're thinking about buying an older home, it's not insurmountable. But those those folks never came back. I had a really good plaster guy. Yeah. After that, never came back. Yeah. No. So. But if somebody's wanting to sell a home and wants your expertise, especially some of these older homes, and wants your passion that you show, what's the best way they can contact you? By phone or text at 317-431-3830. And to get a hold of Ian or I, call 317-672-1938. That's 317-672-1938. Or you can go online at hardworkingmortgageguys.com. That's hardworkingmortgageguys.com. All right. And now we'll get into question of the week. And the question of the week is sponsored by, hey, Rick and I, the hardworking mortgage guys, where we believe in helping and supporting you and your realtor by sending constant updates through the whole loan process. We don't like living in a black hole, so we don't allow it with you. Even if you want to, we'll stop you. We're going to show you the light. All right. So... <laughs> Here is your question. Sure. What was your first car? That I bought or that my parents bought? Whatever one that has the best story. Oh, I, well, the, the very first car that I bought, uh, maybe showing my age a little bit, <laughs> was a Saab 900S. Okay. I I still, I saw one on the on the road yesterday. It was a, a newer one. Um, I loved those cars and it was the, I was 22. I was right out of college and uh, it was at a Tom Wood dealership, I think at 96 and Meridian. It was on a kind of on a platform outside okay. and I was driving by, oh, it was at Keystone at night. Sorry, yeah. Keystone at 96. And um, 
I was like, man, I love this car. I had a friend in high school who had a, a Saab convertible that, that I loved. Um, but I love that car, but it was, it was a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> I will tell you, my parents warned me. Um, they're like, eh, but it was, yeah, it was, a, it was a sweet car. Uh, it was the first car that I bought myself. I financed myself. I, I got a loan for it from, uh, the bank one. I don't know if you remember. I bank remember one. bank one. Yeah. Bank one, which is now chase. And, uh, I love that car. The the ignition in the in the middle on the in between the seats. That was yeah. It's it's interesting when you say something like that because uh Rick and I were both in the car industry for a while. Oh, and okay. so yeah, especially when people get in a sob, even now they still like to do their little key in the middle. And people first get in and they're like, uh, where does this key go? Yeah. Oh, it's right over here. It's in the middle. Yeah, well I had another uh well the newer cars, the European cars um, and I, I, dr I drove, uh, Jeep Cherokees you know, as a, as a realtor, you, you gotta have some space right. for sign. You, you got the whole thing, signs and cleaners, right? You're having an open house and you know, there might be a smidge on the kitchen counter and you, you so you bring your own stuff, paper towels, a mallet. Like if you're putting a sign in the, the, <laughs> the dirts, uh, you know, it's dry. We haven't had rain and you got pounded in a little bit. So I have a whole, I so you need the space. So I drove uh, SUVs for a while and then I downsized a little bit and got a European. Uh, and it was the first time the, you got to step on the brake and then hit the button. Uh, the, actually this one had, you stuck the key, the fob in the, oh, wow. in the ignition, the whole fob. Yep. And the sales guy, <laughs> Just said, okay, you're done. Here you go. You I signed the papers. And I'm like, how does this thing start? <laughs> like, I and it was, I guess, maybe intuitive because I, I figured it out in like a couple seconds. But um, yeah, so it's I it's kind of quirky. Um, and my car now has the the button that you and the but you still have to press on the brake. Yeah. So speaking of that, so uh my wife we got i got her purse button start one she came we did the paperwork she left in it i already had it running for her she gets home she goes how do i shut this off i'll go i go oh just put your foot on the brake and hit the button oh okay so don't feel bad even yeah <laughs> it's like oh i don't know how to turn this on and off yeah well cars and i mean you know i like a little uh diversion from real estate but cars man i guess you know the everything evolves right like yeah. real estate back i mean it wasn't too long ago where buyers would have a stack of well you guys know this a stack of papers to sign mm -hmm. now we do it most of it digitally there's very few documents that need a wet signature i guess back in the day agents were meeting in parking lots and they would sign purchase agreements and 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 all that um so the so it's evolved technology has really helped us save time right but i can't believe some of these cars uh you know and, and all the the technology technological accoutrements yes. that they have and now they're oh, great now yeah. they're saying they're gonna we're gonna have flying cars yeah uh, once would be made next year yeah it's like jetsons yep <laughs> it's it's well, here yeah flying cars it's gonna be interesting when because that's a <laughs> That's a major change. It is. You know? It but, is. Yeah. I'm, I'm open to it. Yeah. I mean, people can't drive on the roads. <laughs> <laughs> you put a thousand people well, that, above Indianapolis in planes, I, we're in trouble. <laughs> well, some some of these roundabouts that you have up here in Carmel are, are rocking some some worlds, some drivers' yes. worlds. Yes, oh, yeah, you can tell that. Yeah. <laughs> so to your point, uh, flying cars, man, that you, yeah. you're right. I think I think on the roundabout, just as a side note, if people would just look at the sign and realize it says yield, not stop. So if there's not a car coming, it says yield, you can go. If there's a car coming, it says yield, you stop. <laughs> That's what yield means, right? Yeah. It's 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 a pretty basic concept and it flows extremely well. Oh yeah. As long as everybody like I can get to work five minutes quicker now because of the roundabouts over over stop line stop yeah. lines and i'm not that far probably farther yeah. than that because once they put the roads over 
Meridian Street. Yep. Oh my gosh, you, yep. you fly, but but it's you. it's it's all about personal preference and coming back Absolutely. to real estate. I have you just you know people want what they want or they're comfortable with what they're yes. and you just have to hear them out and work with them and um so i've had clients who don't come to hamilton county for because of the roundabouts right like, that's, that's fine okay. yeah. yeah you know we we want everyone to their home is their personal respite their right. their sanctuary they we want them to feel comfortable and restful and it's supposed to you know work is tough enough whatever you do and home is where you're building me family memories and happy times and it's your it's your retreat yeah. so yeah so we're gonna get off cars a little bit not that I want to, because I love cars. <laughs> oh, and and by the way, I still love Sobs, and I'm bummed that they. I think they tried to revive the brand, and yeah, it didn't do so well. It didn't. Yeah, but I th Saab was so far ahead of its time, and I love the way they look. I still, it's still probably if it wasn't such a nightmare. Uh, I mean, maybe you know, to a 22 year old kid not making a whole lot of money, maybe it was the wrong car for a 22 year old kids budget um <laughs> but uh i still love the way they look and i still think of that car fondly yeah that's good yeah they, they weren't very well built but they were great i think they, they may cool have cars. gotten better may, maybe in the 90s i don't i don't, I don't know. know i had a friend who sold them and he said they were not as oh bad. okay i, I mean right. just that's what they were but off that even though i don't want to what is, what would you say your superpower superpowers are all right. So, you know, I, I think my superpower is my ability to read my clients, right? And to help them because home buying, even for seasoned home buyers, it's a journey. And helping them navigate that with the least amount of stress, maybe, um, recommending some options you know a lot of buyers come in with a very strict set of wants and needs and sometimes they don't want to go outside that box but they also get frustrated when they're not finding anything that checks those boxes so helping them maybe go outside a little bit right um and look at options. And I've had a lot of success that way uh, where people kind of come into it with very, uh, with very narrow, you know, Blinders but on. then you try, you, you, you try, you read them and you say, look, you know, how about we take a look at something like this or we take a look at something in this area. Have you thought about this? No, but l l let's check it out. And they're like, this is great. This isn't exactly what I'm, what I'm wanting. So I think my superpower to your question is just reading my clients, making it about them. It's not about me. Oh, sometimes I forget when I see a really cool <laughs> older home, I'm like, this is great. Uh, get out of my way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh man, right. This isn't about me. Um, but helping them, um, maybe sometimes expand their options um and really reading them and then this is an evolution so for my clients who haven't worked with me before and they've maybe been referred to me by another you know it's 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 an evolution right so i at, you know ask them what they're looking for what areas and, and you know we kind of go look maybe at an initial set of uh properties um and then we as we continue this journey together and it's truly a partnership as we continue this journey together we evolve and we kind of get synced up and maybe they're not so open to options and i can read that but maybe they are and i can read that too and so i adjust m my relationship based on how I'm interpreting, reading their reactions. And I always 
always pay attention and you have to, to be successful in this business, pay attention to the client and their reactions. You have to. Yeah. Well, one of the things that people tend to forget is that if you don't know something, you can't want that thing, right? Yep. So you see houses all the time and you have a much better idea of what's out there. And so as a, you're obviously a very good listener. So as somebody who listens to people, you can hear what they want. So you may be showing them options, but you're showing them options based on your observation of them, your understanding of them on things that they may have never even considered because they didn't know it was available. Yep. So I think that's huge. It, I think it's why you go with a guru. Yeah, that's right. And again, it's, uh, it, you have to put your client at, in the, in, at the center. Yeah. And even, you know, um, even if it means, uh, a little more work for you in the end, it's, it, you hit, you have to do what you have to do yeah. uh, for the client. All right. So I'm going to ask you another tough one. What do you think your most memorable deal was? Yeah. So, um, there's a couple, uh, when the market was super competitive, I had two, they almost were identical buyers. I had one buyer, husband and wife, they, uh, he got a new job here, uh, in Indiana, in Carmel actually. And they were living in Ohio. So they had a house in Ohio and they were well qualified. I mean, they could go high. They got approved for, you know, a lot. They, they got interest rates were low, super low. <laughs> I almost hate to say how low they were because that's not where they are now. <laughs> but, um, and, but so everyone was in the market and they were looking in Hamilton County and everyone wants to be in Hamilton County or a lot of people want to be in Hamilton County. Um, and rightfully so. Uh, and we kept losing deals. And the other thing too, I want to say, and this is, this is a, a good place to insert this is I take very seriously my fiduciary responsibility to my clients. So when people were offering 50 and $60,000 above list for a home. There were plenty of times when I said, I don't feel comfortable with this. I had clients who we were already at 40,000, 45,000 above list and they wanted to go higher. And I told them, I am very transparent. I am very frank. And I said, I just don't feel comfortable with this. I really don't. I think we'll find something it might take us a while, a little bit longer, but I don't feel, and I think that's part of our, and, and I've had people say, why would you do that? Because obviously it, you know, would affect my commission and all that. Again, it's not about me, right? It's not about us. It is about the client and some clients got whipped up in a, this frenzy yeah. that we saw. And I think what I did that maybe not other people weren't doing was really saying, this is silly. Let's not, let, this is just, you're already at 40,000 above list. I don't feel comfortable going any higher on this particular property. We'll find something else. It Everything works out. We'll find something else. So I had one client and she, she was crying because she and we were offering above list like i said 40,000 time and again and people were outbidding us it was crazy we finally found something and she loves the house and that's it's one memorable client i i don't i don't remember transactions as well as i remember clients right, right? so um we stay in touch. We're social. She, I can't tell you how thankful, you know, it's too bad that she can't come on here. Uh, but I can't tell you how thankful she is that I stepped in and said, I'm not going to let you 
overpay like that for this, right? Um, but this other client, uh, again, still keep in touch with them. They will, they uh, were looking primarily, and this is uh, another example when I, I asked, I, I had them, I'm like, let's let's look at your options here. They wanted to be in, they were dead set on being in Hamilton County and we kept getting outbid. And again, same thing. They had money to, to cash in the bank to uh, pay over list. We were conservative because I didn't, you know, again, I take that fiduciary responsibility very seriously. Even on the seller side too, I take that seriously. Um, and we just kept getting outbid. And you know what? We found a home that they loved in Geist and they never even thought about looking around Geist. And they found something at Geist and they love that house. And we didn't have to pay a crazy amount over. I mean, it was competitive still, but we didn't have to pay a crazy amount. And what they paid, it appraised for above what they, it was a good deal. Yeah. That's and awesome. yeah. Um, but, but they were ready to call it quits because yeah. And that's when you, again, the end goal is helping them realize their goals and their dreams. And then you have to be resourceful and you have to say, let's do a little thinking outside the box here. So the neighborhoods that they were looking in Carmel really reminded me of some of these established neighborhoods around Geist right? They were flexible on location. They didn't necessarily have to be here. They don't have kids, uh, in school. So they didn't need, you know, the school district isn't a concern, but they sort of like the, the, the nicer, uh, well-maintained neighborhoods. And I said, let's, let's go a little bit further East and check out Geist. And it worked out well. Yeah. So great in the area. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I am fully with that because when my wife and I, we bought our house in 2015, we did the same thing. And we went out to McCordsville and our realtor showed us a couple. We got more land, which I wanted because we had kids. We were having kids yeah. and stuff and, and stuff like that. And it, and it was basically about half the price than looking in there. And I'm like, all right, so why would yep. I not do this? Yeah. So by you looking up there, I, I thank you a lot because a lot of realtors would be like, oh, no, I, I only work let's say caramel. Uh, no, no, no. Let, let's look at uh, other options mm -hmm. too. And I, I think that's a brilliant. So Z Zionsville is kind of the same thing. It's competitive, it's expensive, but Whitestown is next door. And, and part of Whitestown is Zionsville schools. Right. So, you know, go a little bit further out. If you don't have to be in Zionsville, you get a little bit more value than being in Zionsville and you're not that far out away. Yep. So if somebody's wanting to work with a kind guy like you is willing to take care of the customer over his own pocket, how would they get in touch with you? Phone or text, 100%, uh, 317-431-3830. Got my phone with me all the time. Number again is 317-431-3830. And to get a hold of Ian or I, go to hardworkingmortgageguys.com. That's hardworkingmortgageguys.com, or you can call 317-672-1938. That's 317-672-1938. And follow us for more Indies Real Estate Gurus. And a reminder, if you have any friends, family, or coworkers looking to buy, sell, refinance, let us know. We'll be more than happy to help you. But David, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you on our show and everything. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. It's like a little coffee, coffee talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. he enjoyed it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Finally, somebody did. <laughs> Branch yeah. NMLS number 33041. Rick Rittman's NMLS number 664589. Ian Arnold's NMLS number is 1995469. Equal housing opportunity. Some restrictions apply.